Okay, well, hello everyone. Um, I think we'll get started right now. Um, my name is Elizabeth Lawn. I'm a Canadian immigration lawyer, and with me I have um, Zia Sumar, who is also another lawyer at our firm. And then uh, we also have our friends from Pearl Cohen, uh, who are uh, U.S. attorneys, um, Ari Farkas and Rebecca Lenetsky. Um, and they're going to uh, be presenting on the uh, U.S. immigration side. So today, oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> All right. No, no, I'm just saying thank you. <laughs> um, so today what we're going to do is we're going to have uh, Ari and Rebecca start first. And today we're really going to concentrate on the permanent residence side. So we had a previous uh, webinar last week about the work permits. And if you missed it and you're interested in taking a look, um, it is uh, on, our, on our website. Um, and I can send you guys the link on, our, um, uh, on the emails that you'll receive afterwards. Um, we'll be sending out a copy of the recording for this webinar and also the slides afterwards as well. But today we're going to be concentrating on permanent residence and how to immigrate on uh, based on the economic categories for both sides of the border. Okay, uh, so Ari and Rebecca, why don't you guys take it away? Okay, well, first of all, thank you very much for this, uh, this wonderful opportunity. Um, as Elizabeth mentioned, we are U.S. attorneys. Uh, we focus on U.S. immigration law, but we're actually part of a, a larger firm that uh, has many other practice areas we work hand in hand, including corporate uh, and taxation. Uh, and so we find that we're able to uh, ass assist clients um, across numerous different areas that are interrelated with immigration. But for today, uh, we, were, we are going to get to uh, specifically items dealing with uh, visas or green cards, uh, as they're called in the U.S. Uh, colloquially, uh, lawful permanent residence more officially. Uh, but first, we're just going to give a quick status update as to you know where we stand with regard to travel, with regard to presidential proclamations and the like. And then I'll turn it over to my colleague, uh, Rebecca, who will discuss uh, immigrant and non-immigrant visas into the United States. So, right. Um, essentially, right now, um, COVID-specific restrictions between the United States and Canada are actually that's to update this, but they are now been extended till August 20th. Um, US can travel is limited to essential travel only. We don't have a very defined uh, definition of what that means, but essentially not uh, tourism, not recreational. Um, we do know that it's only restricted to travel across US land borders, so not uh, international travel via uh, airports. Um, that the local U.S. airports are still, I'm sorry, local ports of entry are dealing with uh, TN visas, still adjudicating that. And this only applies to Canadian citizens uh, and other foreign nationals in Canada. So this is more of a, I call a geographic restriction as opposed to one focused specifically on Canadian citizens. Um, so the travel restrictions that are in place uh, besides Canada uh, have been in place for quite a while now, which are uh, Europe, uh, UK, China, Brazil. Um, and these are restrictions of travel directly, uh, Iran and Brazil, I'm sorry. These are restrictions directly from those countries. Um, however, they people can travel through third countries in order to enter the United States. Um, it applies to any foreign national coming through, not just citizens of Europe, Schengen, which is all of uh, the European agreement, um, but even people who are transitioning through those countries, transiting, sorry, through those countries, they must remain in a third country for at least 14 days before entering the United States, with the exception of U.S. citizens, immediate family members. U.S. green card holders can come directly to the United States and not have to um, have to quarantine for 14 days. And essential and national interest workers, which is essentially people who uh, are related to the U.S. government or people who are involved in the fight against uh, COVID-19. Um, the two big pieces of news I'm sure people have heard about were the presidential proclamations. Uh, the first one being in April 2020, which uh, temporarily suspended uh, immigrant visas into the United States, immigrant being green card only visas into the United States. However, there was a large carve out for immigrant visas for spouses, children of US citizens, those who were to receive EB5 uh, visas, healthcare professionals, 
and other national interests. Um, I do want to point out that if you already had your immigrant visa in hand, but had not entered the U.S. at that time, you were allowed to enter the U.S. This is only a restriction on receiving the visa and being able to enter the United States, which is, as I, I like to say, is a bit of a um, a bit of a statement without any real force behind it, because most most consulates are closed, and so therefore it wasn't possible to even receive an immigrant visa uh, in the first place if you hadn't had it by the date. That by April 2020. In June of 2020, there was a second proclamation that it, um, it extended the April 2020 through December 31st, 2020, which is really way beyond what we thought it would be. It restricted the issuance of new visa stamps uh, at the consulate for H1Bs, H2B, L, and certain J categories, their dependents. Um, it does not affect, though, people who already had their visas. So again, it was a proclamation where if you weren't able to get the visa, if you didn't have your visa already, you weren't able to get it in any case because the consorts were closed. So again, this is a proclamation that is uh, much more in, uh, in statement than in, in, in practice uh, because there just wasn't a way of getting those visas in any case of the consulates. Uh, however, it's important for Canadian citizens is that CBP confirms this does not affect Canadian citizens who generally just need a approval notice and they can enter the United States. Uh, there are a number of exceptions to this. Um, but as we noted here, while it doesn't include E2 visas, it doesn't include uh, O1 visas, uh, individual extraordinary ability, de facto, the consulates are closed and therefore you couldn't even get those visas in any case. Um, additionally, there was an announcement regarding student visas, but it's been retracted. So even students who are in the United States can attend fully online classes in the fall. Um, so the consulates remain closed. However, we do have a spreadsheet showing, we just received this today, a uh, compendium of all the different consulates around the world and what extent they are opening. Um, and we are starting to see small steps being taken, whether they're accepting uh, applications, whether they're accepting uh, certain applications for interviews. And we're seeing this throughout the world, but we're going to see it based upon the comfort level of the Department of State. Uh, however, as of right now, they are all officially closed. Um, some Canadian citizens will be affected by this, specifically those that require visas to be issued at the consulate. I said most don't require it. However, if it's a tree-based visa, uh, E2, for example, then you do need to go to the consulate in order to have a visa issued. Um, there are exceptions, national interest and hardship. Uh, just this morning, a doctor who we helped got her visa to come to the U.S. to work in a coronavirus cancer ward in New York City. Um, and so again, there are exceptions and the consulates will entertain specific applications if need be. Um, as the different consulates are starting to do things differently, for example, we heard that one consulate is accepting applications but not scheduling interviews. Another one is attempting to process renewals that don't require interviews uh, because there's no reason not to, to allow for that in the current climate if there's no need for physical uh, interaction. Uh, there is no update yet on the Canadian consulates reopening. As soon as there is, I'm sure I'll tell Elizabeth and uh, I'll get that message out to everybody. Um, with regard to USCIS, um, so again, as you noted, uh, Canadians can enter with just a valid I-797 for most applications. Premium processing, which was, uh, which was taken off the board, has resumed as of June 22, and we are essentially applying for for every application because we're concerned that it will again be uh be restricted in the future due to some other issues that are coming up um no visa categories have been affected by the presidential proclamations as of yet however both versions of the proclamation did ask for uh insight from the secretary of Homeland security uh, as to what steps should be taken to affect these visa categories in the united states uh, we are seeing, due to USCIS taking in-house the production of green cards and EAD work permits, that there is a 120,000 backlog uh, that wasn't in place before, just because they're having issues with production. Um, there is a statement that came out, 70% uh, of USCIS workers may be furloughed as of August 1, unless they get somewhere between 1.2 and 2.3 billion from uh, US Congress. 
Uh, that's been the news a little lately. So we're going to see how that applies and how that affects processing U.S. And some USCIS offices uh, have reopened. Some have reclosed uh, due to uptick in, in COVID cases in their area. And so we're watching this. Uh, biometrics offices have opened. And so we're keeping uh, a close eye on this because this does have an effect on certain visa types where the preliminary first step after the application is having your fingerprints taken or the last step is going for an interview. Uh, this especially relates to immigrant visas because as of uh, 2018, all immigrant visas require interviews. Although right now we're seeing that some of the offices are issuing uh, the green cards without having interviews because they can argue that, you know, during the current crisis, there's, if we can get away without having an interview, they won't have an interview. So we have had business-based visas issued without interview. Um, with regard to PERMs, uh, that's the process of recruitment and certification by the Department of Labor, uh, we're seeing actually a uh, shortening of the process. And I think this has to do with layoffs, uh, that there are fewer applications because it's hard to argue or request a immigrant visa for a client, uh, for, I'm sorry, for an employee, when you just laid off a certain percentage of your staff due to uh, COVID slowdown. Okay. Yep, hold on, just sorry. also answering your question. Okay. Okay, so uh, yeah. Okay. the next, uh, next phase of this, I'm actually gonna hand over Rebecca, but before I do, I just wanna explain a quick thing. The way the US system is set up, we have uh, a two-tiered system. We have uh, referred to EB visas, which are visas that are uh, immigrant visas, right? For lawful permanent residents, I think in Canada, they call it PR. We add an L to it just because we're in the US, we don't have to make things more complicated. So it's lawful permanent resident. Um, but the way the system is set up is most of these visas are not available right away. The system is, is created so that way, first you would come in on some sort of non-immigrant visa, maybe an H-1B, maybe an L, we'll discuss that, Rebecca will discuss that more shortly. Uh, and then there is a process for transitioning from that non-immigrant visa into the immigrant visa, whether it's through testing labor market or meeting certain additional criteria. Uh, and that's a secondary process that one goes through. And so we're going to spend a little time discussing both the non-immigrant and the immigrant visas that are available for people looking to come to the U.S. So Rebecca, please uh, take it away. Sure. So as Ari said, you know, we do, generally speaking, the majority of the time see people come in on temporary work visa because the wait times for green cards, the process for a green card, there's a lot of demand, there's a lot of backlog. So it's not you know, with unprecedented, it's not impossible to come in as a permanent resident. It just, it's just not what we most commonly see. So we did want to address like some common work visa categories because we know people you know, often are coming from outside the United States and have, especially you know, in the context of this presentation, may have questions about how to get here sooner than later to begin working, you know, pursue different work opportunities, have these discussions with potential employers as you search for work. So I'll quickly run through a few non-immigrant visa categories. So work permits or categories and then get to the green card options. So if I can change slides. So the first visa I'll just briefly touch on, we did talk about in the presentation last week, is the TN visa, which is only available to Canadian citizens. It's also available to Mexican citizens, um, but we limit it here to Canadian citizens in the sense that it's not available to permanent residents of Canada. You must have a passport of Canada or of Mexico. And it's only limited to specific professional categories. Um, it goes reverse between the US and Canada. So it's also an option that's available for people moving from the US to Canada. Uh, though I can't speak to that in as much detail, but it's for people in specific professional categories who have those credentials that match that professional category. And this is for people who are being employed by a US company or who are employed in Canada who are coming to provide, or in Mexico as well, who are coming to the US to provide pre-arranged services in this professional category. So you could be working as an engineer in Canada, as a, as a lawyer in Canada, as a architect in Canada, and be coming to service specific clients under a TN visa, for example. The E2 investor visa is for um, investors or employees of companies with at least 50% shared nationality uh, ownership. So it has to be a, a company that is at least 50% Canadian owned, if we're talking about Canadian citizen, wherein the there has been 
a substantial investment made to start or buy into the company, into the entity. And you have to show that it's substantial relative to what the kind of business does. And this is open to any type of business. It's open to um, investors of the, in the business, or as I said, to people who are coming as employees to work for this business. So it's, it's only limited to nationals of certain countries because it's based on specific treaties. But as long as there is that 50% ownership and you'll be working as a manager or an executive or in a specialized knowledge role, then this is available for any type of business as long as the business, as I said, has been, you know, has had a substantial investment or and is actually operating and running in the US and is not being run only in order to support the livelihood of the investor and their family. The O-1 extraordinary ability visa is for people who have reached the top of their field or have been distinguished in their field. So for the O-1A, this is for extraordinary people who have shown extraordinary ability in the sciences, business, technology, academics, athletics, basically a wide variety of fields. You need to show that you are of a very small percentage at the top of the field. For the O1B, it's for extraordinary ability in the arts, where it's a somewhat lower threshold. You have to show that you've distinguished yourself in the field. And each category has specific criteria that you have to meet in order to prove that you satisfy this category. But this is a great visa option for people who maybe are not so traditionally employed or who have you know, a, a specific uh, career trajectory that's that's not leading them into direct employment by one employer, um, or maybe or we use this often for entrepreneurs. We use this for people who are working for multiple employers or multiple different projects in the U.S. So this allows a very flexible variety of work and employment arrangements. And I will add that this category is not covered by the presidential proclamations from June. So we are turning to this more and more for people who can't pursue other visa categories because of the possible, well, because of the block until December, which does not apply for Canadians, but nonetheless. Um, L1 intercompany transfer is for if you are already working for a company abroad and they're gonna be transferring you to a subsidiary or parent company or affiliate located in the United States. You must have worked for the company for at least a year and you must be coming for a, uh, there are only limited types of jobs that are covered under this. So a manager, executive, or specialized knowledge worker. Again, it has to be at a pretty high level within the company to satisfy this job, this role. And of course, you do have to already have the pre-existing employment arrangement. Uh, H-1B specialty occupation. Again, this is if you have a job offer. So there's a lot of downsides to this, this category. You certainly needs a job offer you there is a annual cap of available visas there are certain minimum salary requirements um, there's a lot of scrutiny paid to this visa category but a lot of times this is our best option we do a lot of h1b visas for people coming to work here in a wide variety of fields but this is again an option you have with a job offer so now i guess we're getting to sort of the heart of this but we'll cover the many categories of, uh, of, of paths to a green card in the United States. The first one, which I won't, I'll just touch on is family-based green cards. This is sponsorship by an immediate relative, meaning a spouse who is a US citizen, a, a child over 21 who is a US citizen. You can sponsor your parents if you are a US citizen. Um, that it, or if you have a adult child and you are a permanent resident or a US citizen, you can sponsor them. You can sponsor a sibling for permanent residence, but many of these categories, unless you're talking about your spouse, your minor child or your parent, you're gonna have a very long wait. And there's different backlogs depending on what country you come from and depending on what category you're in. But this is obviously a, a large number of uh, green cards are in the family-based category. But we'll focus a little bit more on employment-based green cards. So, or various other categories which fall within the broader employment-based. So I categorize here employment-based green cards specifically as those where you need an employer to be participating in the process. So the other categories I'll touch on also involved an employment dimension in the sense that you are coming for 
a a professional purpose or that is the that is the route that you're coming to the US through. It's not family based. However, you don't for the others you don't necessarily need an employer involved. Employment based green cards, either you are an EB1C where you're a multinational executive or manager. So you are already working for a company abroad. They want to sponsor you for a green card to transfer you to the US and be, get permanent residency in the US. That's the EB1C. So that's the second point. The bulk of employment-based green cards, which is open to anyone who has a job offer in the US, is the PERM process, which is conducted first through the Department of Labor. The employer must first conduct advertising, you know, advertising process to show that they couldn't find a US worker who is both qualified for the job and available to take the job. This sounds totally out of the realm of possibility to a lot of people when we first discuss it, but given the way the rules are set up, we generally are able to show that you are the most qualified person for the job. If, if an employer in the US has offered to do a perm for you, they've offered to sponsor you for a green card, generally you are the person that they want for specific reasons based on your qualifications. It's, you know, generally not because they just happen to like you. They generally want the specific qualifications that you are bringing to the role. So you first apply through departments of labor. We call it sometimes call it the labor certification. We show that we could not find anyone to take this position. And then once that's approved, then you apply through United States Citizenship and Immigration Services and get the green card. If you're in the US on a work, on a different kind of visa, on a work visa, then you can transition directly into it. Otherwise you do have to go through a consulate, whether you are Canadian or of any other nationality. The self-petition category, as I said, is also economic-based or professionally-based green card categories in the sense that it is based on your qualifications and your work experience, but you do not necessarily need an employer involved. So these include the National Interest Waiver Green Card, where you do have to meet certain criteria showing that you either have a a higher level degree, meaning a master's or higher in your field, or you meet certain criteria showing you have exceptional ability in your field, and also that you are engaged in work that is of national interest to the United States. They're, they should feel compelled to waive the normal process of, a, of green card sponsorship, of an employer offering you a job, but you do need to show what you're gonna be doing in the US. The second type of self-petition, let's call it, green card is the extraordinary ability green card. You can have an employer petition for this for you, but you can also self petition. You can submit your own application and you have to again, show certain specific criteria, very stringent criteria to show that you are one of a very, very small percentage at the top of your field. So you have to really show that you have exceeded all others in your area of extraordinary ability. Uh, there's a category for religious workers. This is for people who have training as a religious professional who are coming to work for a religious organization in their same denomination. Again, this is a very specific job category. You'll probably know if you do or do not qualify for it in some way, but you know, we can always discuss. Um, and finally, there's an investor green card, you know, through investment in the EB-5 green card. The cost of this did go up late 2019. So it used to be half a million or a million investment, depending on the location of the investment project, if it's in the area requiring, um, you know, uh, requiring more economic stimulus for that particular geographical area, then you can invest a lower amount of 900,000. Um, if you're investing in any other location or in your own project, sometimes it can be up to 1.8 million that you have to invest. This is a fairly long process. There, the wait times are about two and a half years. So you actually get the green card. It's then a conditional green card. You have to remove the conditions after two years. So there is a lot involved in this process, obviously, and it's not a very fast route. Um, I would say a, around all of the green card processes take about a year plus. So you're not rushing into it. And 
as well, it depends on what country you come from. So for some, which I'll get to in a moment, there are long backlogs for actually getting your green card in hand, even if you have been approved for many years. So what we talked about a little bit last week and what I think Elizabeth and I are both going to be talking about today is maintaining a permanent residency between Canada and the US. Uh, so if you are moving between the two countries, if you want to pursue the track simultaneously, is this possible? So you can maintain your US permanent residency even if you're not living in the United States for fairly long periods of time. You can apply for a permit called a re-entry permit to allow you to stay out, out of the country for more than six months, up to two years at a time, as long as you can show a certain point that you continue to maintain your ties to the US. And you do have to renew this permit at least every two years. Some, as you stay out for longer, then your renewal periods will often get you know, go down to one year. And there may be questions about whether you have continued to maintain your ties in some way to the US. Um, there are also generally tax consequences to maintaining your US LPR status. Uh, and there's certainly tax consequences to maintaining your US citizenship. We do deal with people who decide to give up their citizenship um, and help people who want, who have stayed out of the country for long periods who no longer want the tax requirements that are entailed with that. But that's a discussion usually specifically for an accountant to decide whether it's worth your while to maintain this. Um, and then we can discuss how to maintain the permanent residency. If you are pursuing Canadian permanent residency, this is maybe a topic we can talk about a little bit back and forth, Elizabeth, at the very end, whether it's possible to maintain both. Um, at generally, it's some, you, know, you do have residence requirements for, Canadian, for maintaining Canadian permanent residency, and you do have certain technical requirements, as I said, for maintaining US permanent residency. You have to maintain certain ties to the country. You have to, if you have, if you have the obligation to file taxes, you have to indicate indicate that you are a permanent resident of the United States. You can't say you're a permanent resident of somewhere else. And you have to keep filing these re-entry permits. So at some point, you may have to make a choice. Probably you will have to make a choice is a little too strong wording. Um, and the reason we want to discuss this specifically is because we, we do know that in the US particularly, nationals of certain countries, especially, especially India, China, uh, with some categories, the Philippines, with some categories, Mexico, there are long wait times, backlogs, uh, because of high demand from those countries for these specific visa categories. So we have had conversations with people who have been turning to Canadian permanent residency as a backup or as a different plan, or maybe it turns into plan A and you still do want the US as a plan B running in the background. Um, and again, Maybe my language of cannot you that you cannot maintain dual permanent residence status is a little bit too strong, but there are situations where you will run into a conflict and perhaps need to navigate that or make some decisions because of certain timing restrictions or uh, filing restrictions that would make it difficult to make this decision, especially if you establish a life and and a commitment to one country or the other, if you are in Canada, for example, you've obtained your Canadian permanent residency, your number then becomes available for a green card in the US. Are you going to take the time to pursue that? If you do take the time to pursue that, are you then willing to come into Canada as come sorry, come into the US as often as possible to as often as necessary to get the reentry permit? to make sure you maintain certain ties to the country? Are you willing to take on the tax filing obligations that that would entail? So that's, I think, where we're going to leave this question for now. And I'll turn it over to Elizabeth and maybe we'll have a little back and forth at the very end to figure out whether you can maintain both or not. I guess that's the question of the day. Stay tuned. And <laughs> we'll, we'll let you know. <laughs> and we'll have, yeah, we'll have a discussion. So let, whether uh, immigrating to the U.S. is your plan A or immigrating to Canada is your plan A and you have a plan B, um, let's, uh, let's try to, uh, let's, t uh, let's look at Canadian uh, immigration. Okay, so let me share my screen here. 
Okay. So, uh, speaking about uh, Canadian immigration, let me talk a little bit. Last time we uh, spoke about travel restrictions uh, on the temporary basis. Let me just speak to the processing during COVID times of uh, permanent residence applications and how they might be affected. In general, the applications are still being processed. The, pro uh, the officers are still working, although um, the capacity of each office may be diminished. Um, a lot of the officers are working from home and it is the government. So moving, uh, you know, officers to home and setting them up at home uh, can take a little while with logistics. So what we have been told is that the, the officers there, they were still working from home. It just may take a little bit more time than usual. So some of the processing times that you see on the website may not be accurate. Most of those processing times are pre-COVID, okay? Um, landing interviews. If you are inside Canada and you um, are about to be what we call landed. So in Canada, we have two processes for getting your permanent residence. First, they give you the approval and they'll give you a confirmation of permanent residence. That's the document. But you don't normally get your permanent residence until you go for a landing interview where you see an officer and they give you all the rights and tell you what your rights are and they sign your confirmation of permanent residence. During COVID times, a lot of the landing interviews are either canceled and they just send you um, the uh, letter saying congratulations, you are now a permanent resident or um, they are talking about telephone uh, landing. I don't know if that's actually happening. Most of the clients that we have had, they've just been sent this notice um, that congratulations, you can land it. Now, if you're outside of Canada, that's a little bit more uh, complicated. So if you have received your confirmation of permanent residence before March 18th, you are able to get on the plane you can show this and you're supposed to be able to get on the plane and come to Canada. When you do come to Canada, you do have to convince the officer that you're not just visiting Canada, you're actually coming to Canada to stay. Otherwise, they may not let you come into Canada. But when you come there, if you get it before uh, March 18th, then you can actually land in Canada. Now, um, if you did not receive your confirmation of permanent residence before March 18th, we have recently been receiving communications from immigration asking about travel plans and et cetera. So it does look like they're trying to have plans for people who they, to bring them to Canada to see whether or not you intend to be in Canada, uh, you know, to live in Canada for now and, or whether or not you're just going to be visiting Canada and therefore it's not as urgent for you to land at this present time. So as Rebecca was uh, talking about, the residency requirements in Canada are, are quite different from the US. Really, Canada is looking for the amount of time that you are spending in Canada um, in order to maintain your permanent residence. So it's very simple. The rule is two out of five years, okay? It does not have to be consecutive you just literally count the days. And even if you've been in Canada for half a day, it's still counted as one day, okay? You can, um, there are two exceptions to the rule. If you are living with your Canadian spouse or if you're a child and you're living with your parent who is a Canadian, that time that you are spending with your family member is counted towards residency in Canada. So for example, if I was a Canadian permanent, if I was a permanent resident of Canada, but my husband was a Canadian, I could go with him and live in the States for 10 years, 11 years, 15 years, never step foot in Canada and still maintain my permanent residency as long as I'm living with my Canadian spouse. The second exception to this rule is if I have an employer in Canada who is sending me overseas to do work. So for example, my employer says to me, I need you to go and research on this special project and you're still my employee, I'm just sending you overseas to do the work. If I was to need to go and do this work for four years, 
that amount of time can basically be an exception uh, to the rule, and that amount of time is counted towards the same amount as if I was actually residing in Canada and being in Canada physically, okay? To qualify for citizenship, it's three out of five years, okay? So of course you have to have your permanent residency first, but you can actually get one year of credit for the time that you've spent in Canada before you became a permanent resident. It's counted as half time. So if I've been in Canada for two years, I get one year credit. If I've been in Canada for one year, I get six months credit. Okay, so let's talk about how to get permanent residency. Today, I'm just going to concentrate on the economic categories. And um, we'll be talking about express entry, which is the most popular, most well-known applications. We're gonna be talking also about some other um, application uh, programs that you may or may not have heard about. And then we're going to also talk about how you might be able to qualify, um, you know, for, and, and maybe, uh, look at temporary residence as a step towards the, the permanent residency. So express entry, how does this work? First of all, you have to create an online profile. You create an online profile if you qualify under three different categories, the federal skilled worker class, Canadian experience class, or the federal skilled trades class. Most of you who have not been in Canada will only qualify for the federal skilled worker class, okay? Um, and for that one, you need to have, um, we'll talk a little bit about that afterwards. Um, but if you qualify, you can get into the express entry pool. Now, just because you can get into the express entry pool, it doesn't mean that you've actually applied for permanent residence. When you get into the express entry pool, you'll get a series of points called the CRS points, Comprehensive Ranking System. And it's going to be based on your personal background and if you have provincial nomination. Every two weeks or so, the government has a draw where they announce a number. If your CRS score is above that number, you'll receive an invitation to apply and then you can actually apply for permanent residency. If your score is below that, you can't apply, you stay in the pool. You stay in the pool for a year and then your profile would expire. So it's not just about getting into the pool. It's about what your score is to see if you can actually get out of the pool. So let's talk about how to get into the pool. And this is the first one. And if you are from outside of the country, this is likely the one that you would qualify for. So what we first need is we need to see that you have high skilled work experience. One year of high skilled continuous work experience in one occupation that's full time, okay? Um, and then you also need to pass the IELTS um, or CELPIP. So for IELTS score, it would be 6.0 in each category reading, writing, listening, and speaking. And you need to have a certain amount of financial savings. Uh, for a single person, it's around 13,000 Canadian dollars. That's a 30% savings from the US dollar there, okay? Um, so it's, uh, you need to have that. And if you have you know, family members, you're adding a few thousand for each person. And then we're going to look at your background and we're gonna do a score. This is not the, CRS Express Entry score, it's another federal skilled worker score and you have to score at least 67 in order to qualify in order to get into the pool. Um, this is just to get into the pool. These conditions often are not enough for you to get out of the pool and get the score. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit more about that afterwards. The second category is the Canadian Experience Class. It's for those people who have Canadian work experience in Canada when they are not a full-time student. So most of the time, people who get this are people who have work permits in Canada um, and they have worked in Canada and then uh, they can qualify. Skilled trades are for people in the trades. They normally need to have either a LMIA um, or 
uh, certification in Canada uh, for their trades. Okay, so let's say um, you are able to get into the pool. I have four people right now in the pool. Juan is 415, Anna 401, Jean is 436, Trupti has 501, okay? Um, I think the last draw was, well, we had a PNP draw that didn't, that, but the one last time for Federal Skilled Worker was 478. If it's 478, who's gonna get out? Of course, Troop T, okay? Now, there's a caveat to this. In between March, mid-March, and the last draw was the one they had for Federal Skilled Worker, but before then, they only invited people who qualified under Canadian Experience class, or people who qualified under um, the with the provincial nomination. So, um, under those circumstances, even if your score was above the draw score, you weren't going to be invited. Okay. Now they've gone back to inviting um, everybody. At least in the last draw, they were. We'll see how it goes um, as time goes on. But we're expecting them to invite. Uh, more and more people under the federal skilled worker class, okay? Um, so what gives you the score for the CRS system? First of all, H, okay? I like to say when it gets to your 30th birthday, it's no longer gonna be a happy birthday, okay? Because every year that it's your 30s, your points go down by five points, when is your 40s, it goes down by 10 points, 11 points. And when is your 45th birthday? The good news is it doesn't go down anymore. The bad news is you get a big fat zero on your age. So compared to people in their 20s who might have 100 points or 110 points, oftentimes people who are older, um, that could be an issue with them being able to get the score. Education is very important. Right now, to get the 470s, often we're looking at people who have two degrees, um, a bachelor's degree or another three-year degree and another master's, even a post-grad certificate or you know something else, but usually two degrees. Language, English or French is very good. And if you know French, we get a bump as well. Okay, but you do have to do the language exams, irregardless of whether or not this is uh, your only language or first language, everybody has to do the language exams. Um, and it's IELTS or CELPIP for English and the TEF for French. Uh, you can also look at Canadian work experience and that's the work experience um, that you have in Canada as an employee um, in Canada. Foreign work experience can also count. Your spouse, oftentimes single people might get a little bit higher than a married person unless your spouse is what I call a super spouse. So a spouse who has a higher level of education, language scores, and some Canadian work experience, if they have you know, higher levels, then they might give you a bump. But spouses, the points for spouses are relatively minimal compared to the principal applicant. Um, the provincial nominee programs we're going to talk about, there are certain provincial nominee programs that are linked to the express entry. It's not all provincial nominee programs will give you 600 points, but those who are linked to the express entry system will give you 600 points. Uh, if you previously studied in Canada, you will get points for that. If you have arranged employment, now people often think, oh, if I have a job offer, I have arranged employment. No, that is not necessarily the case. If you have an employer specific work permit, not an open work permit, an employer specific work permit, and or an LMIA, you can get 50 or 200 points depending on your position if you have a job offer that's at least one and a half years. For the LMIA exempt employer specific work permits, you have to work there for a year before you can get those points. If you have an LMIA, you get those points right away. If you um, have siblings for Canadians or permanent residents in Canada, you get some points. 
the ability to speak fluent French, you get another bump. If you can speak fluent French and you can speak English as well. Finally, trade certification for those people who are in the construction trades or cooks and chefs. Okay, so those are the points for express entry. Now, a lot of you might be very excited and say, oh, you know what? My point's probably going to be very high. We can take a look at that and, and see, okay? But if you're looking at this and you're thinking, oh, you know, I don't have all of these things. I may be older. I may not have as, as many, like two degrees, etc." cetera. Then you're, we're gonna have to look at some alternatives. So first of all, I wanna talk about provincial nominee programs. What provincial nominee programs are is that they're, pro, uh, they're programs that every province has put together. So immigration is federal jurisdiction in Canada. The Canadian government is in charge of immigration, but the federal government has made an agreement with every province in Canada to allow each province to have their own programs. And these are called provincial nominee programs. And so each province has separate programs that if they feel like they want you and you're willing to live in that province when you get permanent residence, then you can get either 600 points added to the express entry application, or you might apply separately if it's not linked to express entry for just permanent residence on its own. There are 10 different provinces in Canada and three different territories. So I'm not gonna be able to go into all of the provincial nominee programs, but let me just give you an overview of some of the things you might keep in mind if you are applying from outside of the country. First of all, almost, most of the provincial nominee programs will want you to have some ties to the province. You'll neither need a job offer or a studied in the province or both. Okay, so uh, most of the provincial nominee programs, if you don't have any ties to the country, will be out of your range. There are a few that target occupations. For example, Ontario has a tech draw. So basically, they, Ontario says, we really want people who are in the tech industry. And if you have a background where you have worked in some of the IT fields and um, it, you want to live in Ontario and your score, you're in the express entry pool and your score in the ex express entry pool is pretty high, you know, 450s, 440s, etc. cetera. Um, they may, you have to be in there first. You can't just apply directly to them. But if they see you in the pool, they might like you enough to give you an expression of interest and allow you to apply with them. Um, and if you apply with them, you'll get 600 points, okay? There are two other provinces. Uh, Saskatchewan has an occupations in demand category. They do, you have to, you can apply directly to them, but they have another draw. They have another pool where they, look at whether or not your occupation is something that they need. We have a list of occupations that they, they kind of target and also the other conditions as well. And then they have a draw where they announce their own number. So it's another uh, sort of pool uh, that they, you get drawn out of. And if you get drawn out of there, you get 600 points and then you can also uh, add that to your express entry. Nova Scotia demand category B is something that just happens once or twice a year uh, where they have a list of occupations that they want to. And once in a while, they just open it and it closes in a matter of few minutes. But if you're lucky enough to apply during that time, then you might be able to get in and get 600 points. There are also great deals for Francophone speakers. The Canadian government really, really wants to attract francophone speakers. So not only will you get a lot of points for uh, the, the, the uh, express entry, but let's say you can get a certain amount of points, but you still don't have enough. Then for example, Ontario has a French speaking skilled worker class where you, if you are in the pool and you have, you know, okay points like 400 something, 
they may invite you to apply with them for uh, 600 more points. This one, they do require you to have a bachelor's degree at least. A lot of people are asking me, oh, what about the investor entrepreneur programs for provincial nominee programs? Provincial nominee programs for entrepreneurs have gone through a lot of changes. And the most recent changes, the federal government has really pressured the provinces to ask the applicants to put their money where their mouth is. So basically right now, um, a lot of these programs are, are not as great. First of all, you'll have to uh, you'll have to be selected. You'll have to put in a proposal. You have to be selected, and then if you are selected, they will um, ask you to put a performance agreement together. And you usually will have around a year and a half or so to um, perform what you have said for your business. You'll you'll hire these many people. You know you might um, be investing in this amount. You'll get a work permit to do so, but you don't have permanent residence yet. After a year, a year and a half, you can apply to get your um, performance agreement assessed and the officer will see, did you fulfill the terms of your performance agreement? And then if you have, they will issue a, you a certificate and then you can apply to the federal government for uh, permanent residence. So all in all together, you're looking at maybe around four years or so before you can get the nomination. This is for the provincial nominee program. This is all about, also it's about active management. It's not about just passive, I give money. US is easier, right? You just give the, it's a lot of money, <laughs> but you, if you give it, you know, you will get, you don't have to manage the program. These are looking for active management. Um, there are a couple of other area specific programs and there's an Atlantic immigration pilot and a rural and northern immigration pilot. And what these uh, things are is the Atlantic provinces are on the east coast. I'm from uh, 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 island called Newfoundland back in the east and there we have a we have four provinces in the Atlantic provinces um, that are um, you know, by the ocean, around Maine, Vermont, uh, that area. Um, and, you know, these provinces where we're missing, um, we're, we're needing a lot of young people to go there. And so basically uh, to attract uh, people to go there, the government has put this program on. The Rural and Northern immigration, Immigrant Program is for um, more of the Northern uh, communities and a lot of the Northern Ontario communities, for example, are participants in this. Now, you can't just say, oh, I'm going to apply to this program and get in. I'm willing to live over in those rural places I can get in. No, you do have to usually have a job, you have to have a job offer from the community, okay? And you have to be recommended by that community to get into this program. Um, the different, there are two different programs. So there are some of the different uh, requirements, but usually you need at least one year of qualifying work experience, or you have to graduate from the eligible program in the region, uh, Atlantic provinces or the rural northern region, in order to not have the work experience and still qualify. The language benchmarks are quite, are much lower than express entry, for example, uh, they can be much lower. Um, and so it's a good one, but you have to really have that job offer uh, from the community in order to apply. Um, there's a caregiver program that we have right now, where if you work in Canada for two years, caring for children, elderly or disabled people in their home, you don't have to live there, you just have to take care of them in their home, then you can get your permanent residence. Um, you do have to have one year of post-secondary education credential and meet the language benchmark of five. So right now, if you have a job offer to do this, we can apply first for a work permit for you so that you can get the two years of work experience there, and then you can apply for permanent residence. Um, 
we have a self-employed category for artists and athletes who you have been able to be self-employed for at least two out of the last five years in your talents. When I'm talking about artists and athletes, it's not just, you know, someone who's drawing, um, you're talking about uh, graphic designers, you know, musicians, coaches, athletes, um, and you either have to be self-employed or uh, participate at a world-class level. Uh, at least two years, uh, two out of five years, okay? You also have to show that you can, in Canada, be able to be self-employed and, and be successful in your talents, okay? So it's not just, oh, I've been successful over there. You have to show that you can be doing the same thing in Canada as well. Uh, the startup visa is something um, that is, is a good program for those people who are who are entrepreneurs and you have an innovative idea or you have been working with innovative technology um, and, and as such, okay? So if you have five founders, up to five founders of uh, people can apply together. You have, you're gonna be opening up a Canadian startup and this is a permanent residence application and you can also get a work permit while you're waiting for the permanent residence if you want. So in order to qualify, each founder has to own at least 10%. Together, all of the founders, it can be up to five. So you can be one, two, three, four, five, okay? But all of the founders together must have the majority shares in the business. Each founder has to have active management. We're, we're not looking at passive investment. Everybody has to have a management role in the company and you have to pass the level five for English or French. The most important thing is that the company needs to receive support by one of the designated organizations. And this is where the innovations come from. So the government of Canada, they said, we wanna attract really good startups to come to Canada. But as government officials, we're not great at deciding who's going to be successful, who's not. So we're going to outsource this to experts. And who are experts in our field? Well, we're going to list um, incubators, angel investor groups, venture capital groups on our list. And if you can get accepted by one of them, so if you're accepted into one of the designated incubators into their program, or an angel investor from one of the angel investor groups decides to invest 75,000 in your company or 200,000 by a venture capital group into your company, then you, all the founders, can then apply for permanent residence. So this is, uh, you know, it had a slow start, but in the last year or so, it has really uh, started gathering a lot of steam. And a lot of these uh, incubators, angel investor groups are now actively participating in this. So if this is something that is in your wheelhouse. Let us know and we can uh, talk to you about it and see if we can get um, you know, into, one of these, uh, into one of these groups. So, you know, think about all of this. What should you do if you really are interested in coming to Canada? First of all, you're gonna have to see if your points are high enough to apply right now off the bat from where you are in, uh, in you know, where you are, okay? Some of you might be high enough, a lot of you may not, okay? If you are not, then look at some of the alternatives. For example, you can th think about studying first in Canada. If you study in Canada, you will get a post-grad work permit if you study in a public university or college um, afterwards. And you can get a work permit, you can work. If you have a spouse, whether you're married or common law, someone you have lived with for one year in a conjugal relationship, that person can get an open work permit as well. So you can collect points then for the Canadian work experience that might give you the bump to apply uh, under the express entry system. Not only that, if you have worked or studied in Canada, you may also qualify for other programs such as the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the provincial nominee programs, or maybe even the AIP or RNIP as well. Finally, 
if you don't really feel like studying, but you are entrepreneurial, uh, consider starting a business in Canada. Um, today, I didn't have enough time to really get into depth about different entrepreneurial techniques um, and, and strategies. Uh, I am going to be doing a webinar with the Royal Bank of Canada next week uh, uh, on Wednesday uh, at 8 a.m. Eastern time. And we're going to be talking more about that. And you're welcome to join on that as well. Okay. Okay, and this is our contact information. If you have any questions, please do tell us that you have uh, gone to a webinar. And I, I know for our firm, we'll give you a discount on the consultation. I, I, I don't know about Proco if you, um, but certainly, you know, this is our, our uh, contact information and Proco and we'll have their contact information for you as well. Okay. All right, so, and we'll send out these slides uh, to you guys as well afterwards. So, Rebecca, shall we have a conversation about how to maintain PR and, and both sides of the border? Um, I'll invite Ari into, and of course, Dia as well, into this conversation. Before the, pres just to summarize where we were before the presentation actually started, Elizabeth and I sort of discussed, well, when does this actually have to get disclosed? or become an issue about having permanent residence in one country or another. And you know, when you're applying for a US green card, there isn't anywhere that actually asks you outright, are you a permanent resident of another country? You have to disclose your nationality or your other citizenships, but not necessarily your permanent residence. So I, I think the conclusion we were sort of getting to is that it maybe comes down to the logistics of the days that you are able or willing to spend in one country or another, though I do still think it violates the spirits of the law in the sense that you cannot be a permanent resident of one of two countries at the same time, because there is a, there is a certain requirement in U.S. law to maintain your ties to the United States. You're not supposed to be a permanent resident somewhere else if you are ostensibly well, a permanent resident of Canada. Yeah. But Ari, I'll get your take on that as well. Well, just the, the, the law specifically says you have to have not just the, uh, the residing in the country, but you have to have the intent to reside. And so, you know, filing a tax return as a non-resident or, you know, showing a defined intent to reside in another country would undercut the, uh, your permanent resident. Now, it's, it's very interesting. There are some very unique cases that discuss this uh, that it's hard to lose your green card, to your permanent resident status in the United States. It However, <laughs> it can be done. The, the two issues that you come up against is one is a practical issue where Customs Border Protection essentially says, we're giving you a choice upon entry, file out this form and sign it before us saying you're giving up your status uh, and then we'll let you in. Otherwise, we're not letting you into the country if they have substantial questions. Uh, or the second time this becomes a problem is when you may apply for citizenship. And they look back and they realize that, wait, you've been filing as non-resident. You, you know, have been living out of the country for you know, 297 days a year, but have made sure to come back, you know, religiously every six weeks for one day or every, you know, every three months for a week. And so those are the type of things where, you know, intent is very important uh, and can come back in, in, in a further application possible. Yeah, I mean, on the Canadian side, the government, we don't, we don't go into that depth of intent to reside or not. It's either you've been in Canada for two years or you haven't been in Canada for two years. And um, if you haven't been in Canada for two years, you can apply for humanitarian, you can go to appeal and they catch you, first mm -hmm. of all, okay? And first of all, for uh, the, the rule is that you have to be in Canada two out of five years from the date of examination. So when are you examined? Well, you are examined when you apply for the renewal of your permanent resident card. The card is like a passport, it's a travel document. Um, just because you don't have the card doesn't mean you've lost the PR, but a lot of people get that confused. So they will file to extend their PR card thinking, oh, if I don't have the PR card, I'm gonna lose my status, but then they, when they file it, they may be missing even at just a few days or a few months. And they um, then 
at the time of examination when they filed it, they don't fulfill the residency and they're out of luck. So now oftentimes, you know, you, you can keep on going and just wait until you fill the two years before you file the permanent resident card and then you're safe. Um, the other point of examination is when they try to re-enter Canada or they're filing another application and the officer takes a look at their situation and they say, ah, I don't think you met the res residency requirements. But other than that, and you know, there are the exceptions to the rule as well. Um, if they have been found that they haven't met the residency requirement, they can always ask for humanitarian compassionate uh, reasons, uh, grounds to, to appeal it. Uh, but it's often difficult to do that, especially you know, for some people, they've never really resided in Canada. Um, but other than that, I mean, they could technically uh, reside in the U.S., be in Canada on the specified days, and mm -hmm. still meet it. No. I mean, overall, on a practical issue, it's kind of like hoarding the PR. <laughs> it's kind of like you want both. Yeah. <laughs> Which I'm sympathetic to, but you need, but in terms of the points of examination, your points about the, it being only a travel document, but you, you do have to have a valid PR card to get into Canada, so you can't Not put off. Well, it depends. It depends on okay. how you're traveling. <laughs> yes. Oh, okay. You yeah. definitely need to have a valid green, well, you need to either have a valid green card, which are now kind of green again, they weren't for a while. Um, or if you stay out too long and it's expired, you can go, or if you stay out too long and now you're over the one year mark where the assumption is that you have abandoned your permanent residency, you can apply at a consulate abroad to get a travel document back in. But that becomes a much more complex issue it, and does not matter how you're traveling into the US, CBP does not care. <laughs> Zia, do you want to explain how they can travel back to Canada without the card? Yes. <laughs> if you're actually traveling by land, and this is where we see a difference between coming in by flight or by a land border. And so if you're entering Canada by a land border, then not you don't necessarily need to have that valid PR card. You do still have to be able to demonstrate that you hold permanent resident status. Um, but you can, there is the possibility of being able to enter Canada without that uh, valid PR card. Um, through the land borders. Personal story, which maybe I shouldn't tell on re recorded uh, webinar, is I once forgot my pass my Canadian passport traveling back to Canada, and they let me in on just a photo of it. <laughs> I a land border. back in the day, they used to let you in on a Canadian tire membership card. No longer the Canadian <laughs> border. This was a few years ago. I mean, this was a while ago. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, oh, sorry. Go so ahead. One point though, there is a, a, a process for the re-entry permit, which we do a lot for people who get green cards at, at a bad time in their life. Not bad time, but for example, we did a green card for someone who the, they just got accepted to a master's program uh, abroad or their company wants to assign them, uh, represent someone who worked for the uh, um, International Monetary Fund and they were gonna be sent uh, abroad for three to five years. And so there is a process where you can ask for a permit to stay abroad for two years. Uh, and you can ask for that permit up to three times. So in theory, if you're not counting towards citizenship, right? So you're not looking toward that. You just want to maintain your green card status. You could stay out of the country for two year periods, come back. You'd have to be here to reapply. You have to be in the U.S. to do your fingerprinting. You can't do that abroad anymore. Um, but in theory, if you planned it right, you could be in the U.S. for maybe three, four weeks in total. Uh, maybe let's times three. So let's say be in the U.S. for three months in total over a six-year period, which would then allow you to, you know, meet your, your, you know, get your Canadian, maybe in other countries, permanent residence as well, and then come back to the U.S. and then relocate permanently in order yeah. to, to do it. So there is, there is a process for it, but it requires some planning. Yeah. And the other nice thing about getting citizenship in one of the other countries is even getting a work permit, the TNs become available if you're, uh, you know, and the NAFTA is yeah. the Canadian side and yeah. Canadians don't need visas to go to the U.S. Um, so there's a lot of nice things that getting the citizenship in one country uh, will have for the other. For sure. Yeah. I think a I client would... once, once came to me with a 17-year plan to get citizenship <laughs> in the United States that required him to 
I think it was moved to Australia initially, then to Canada, and okay. then to the United States, and then apply for it. It was very complicated. I wish them the best of luck. <laughs> the, thing people, the thing people go through for a U.S. green card is sometimes astonishing, but yeah. hey, it does, I, you know, we've had clients, I think both Ari and I, who it has taken 20 plus years, you know, there's a backlog for Indians now, obviously, of, of Indian nationals of significantly longer than that, but the good, actually, this, actually, this is a question someone asked me at the very beginning, and I said, I'll try to do it at the Q&A, um, if you can extend, I don't know if they're still on the webinar now, um, if you can extend the H-1B visa past the sixth year, if you have an approved I-140, uh, or no, sorry, if you have a pending perm um, besides recapture time, and the answer is yes, but only if you filed before the end of your fifth year, and that is protected by law. So if you're, to whoever asked this, if you are in this situation, um, we should probably have a consultation to discuss how that could work out. Um, and if you, if the perm was filed for you at the right time, you, you have the right to an extension while the perm is pending. Um, and that's a situation, people are extending their H-1B visas for very long, very, very long periods of time because there's this backlog. Right. Yeah, but that, that led to an interesting issue that actually uh, article suggested moving to Canada. I think it was the focus of it was um, yes. uh, under the, the current administration, uh, the renewal applications are considered de novo. They're a new, they're not given a certain level of deference. The fact that you've had a previous approval. So there are times where someone, in the case specifically in this article, was someone who had been in the United States, had a pending perm, had a pending application, and then in their three-year extension, it was denied. And so they couldn't remain in the United States. At the end of the day, I don't recall, I think they considered moving to Canada, but they wanted to maintain it. So in the end, I think they took a, a lower paying position uh, in a similar field and stayed in the United States, but it was a consideration, is that what happens if the extension is denied later on, and you have another five years ahead of you before you can uh, get your green card. So you never know when a backup will be important. <laughs> um, Zia, do we have any more questions um, from the Q&A? Yeah, we've definitely gotten some great questions. Um, Elizabeth, you spoke about work experience requirements for federal skilled worker and for Canadian experience class. Can you elaborate, is it any type of work experience? Are there specific positions that people can use? Right. So for the Canadian experience class, uh, the work experience that you have to have is this. You need to have at least one year out of three years in Canada when you are not a full-time student, that you are working legally in Canada. You have to be employed. You can't be self-employed. You can't really own the company or have a majority share or significant shares in the company. And you normally need to have filed taxes to show that you were employed. And it has to be a high skilled position, not O, A, or B, for those people who, who are familiar with that. Um, so that is the work experience for the Canadian experience class. As for the work experience for, um, for wor a foreign uh, experience, it's just mainly high skilled work experience. You can count uh, self-employment for Foreign work experience, a foreign uh, worker, foreign skilled worker class. It can be, it can be self-employed. It can be while you're studying. It can be a lot of things that the Canadian experience class uh, is not. So each of those are very specific, and I would encourage you if you are interested in this, um, to to you can come and go for a consultation and see, you know, where you lie on on qualifications for that. So Elizabeth, looking at what you just said in terms of the requirements for work experience for a skilled worker versus Canadian experience class, so I didn't hear anything about you, the fact that you can't be studying while you're getting work experience on the federal skilled worker. So if a student is, is work, like let's say someone holds a study permit, but they're working at the same time um, in Canada, can they use that work experience to qualify under skilled worker? Yes, you can use that work experience to qualify yourself. We have a lot of students who have, who are, you know, doing their PhDs and PhDs take forever sometimes to get, right? And you can use the RATA work as work experience to qualify you to put you in the pool. Now that work experience, however, is not counted as the Canadian work experience that gives you extra points for express entry. So that you may or may not have enough points for that. 
um, and we may need to look at other options to boost up your score as well, but you can get yourself into the pool because of that. And then does the work experience have to be related to your uh, education or to past work experience? No, it does not. It does not have to be related to your uh, to your studies. Um, for all those students who are looking at this, I'm, we're going to have another Honestly, this week has been a week of webinars. This month has been another webinars. We will have another webinar tomorrow for international students. Um, to if you go to our website lmlawgroup.com, um, we have another webinar tomorrow that's held with IDP, who administers the IELTS. They're going to be talking about how to which IELTS centers are open and how to get, improve your IELTS scores. And we're going to be talking in depth for students who are in Canada about how to get permanent residence. Um, and what you need to do to maintain your study permit and work experience as well. Are there any questions, Rebecca and Arif, uh, that you'd like to answer uh, on the Q&A? Um, there've been, the questions have been uh, very varied. Um, a lot of people had questions, I guess, I think about um, as researchers or people working in STEM and what kind of visa category or sorry, what kind of green card categories would be appropriate. So uh, maybe Ari, you want to say a couple of words about if you're working as a postdoc, uh, whether in Canada or the US, it seems kind of both people from both ends um, were asking about green card, different green card options if you're working in STEM, in you know research and a postdoc field, something like that. I'll start by saying that um, a number of the green card options, especially for this, are ones that require employment. So if you're working in a research facility, for example, uh, there is a green a direct path to green card for researchers in, uh, in specific facilities. Uh, and that's a great way to do it if you can get that. We've seen that um, across the board. It's, it's uh, very tempting. It's, it's, a, it's a straight path, essentially. It's a straight shot to a green card. Uh, one of the other benefits of STEM is if you're looking to, if you can find a position in an H-1B, usually most STEM positions are clearly um, special activations. No one questions that it requires a specific set of knowledge to, to be an accountant or be a lawyer. But the same is true for engineers, for architects, because whether there's licensing, you just can't be involved in these uh, positions without having uh, gone to school. It's a specific set of knowledge. I think we, we have a problem now with programmers because uh, so much has, has become of the of those you know the self-taught programmer in their basement who ends up selling a company for seventy five million dollars you know for some program they created and so that's always been a problem but you know specifically for STEM there are uh, pathways directly to green card but there are also intermediate pathways that are usually available because it's such a, a clearly defined special application. I also mentioned one of my, um, in, in my answers, one of the questions from someone who, I don't know what field specifically he was doing research in, but described himself as a research scientist, uh, mentioned the national interest waiver. We have a lot of success with the national interest waiver for people working in STEM, for working in research. Um, if you can show a compelling national interest to your work. So you're doing something in biomed, biotech. Um, you know, often we even do for economics and mathematics, you, if, there's, if there's some uh, so societal interest, I would say, to what you're doing, it doesn't need to be even national in scope. And you meet a certain base level criteria. Um, if you have a certain track record in the field, it's not necessarily for people who are new graduates. You know, if you're if you've studied in the U.S., you obviously should take advantage of optional practical training. PT there still to date is a STEM extension of 24 additional months of work authorization. If you are coming from STEM, um, to you know to build up your resume to show that you meet certain criteria. But generally speaking, for the national interest waiver, if you have a higher level degree, so masters or higher, and you are working in an area that is in some way compelling to the United States, there, there's a lot of flexibility as long as you have a, a certain degree of a track record to show that you are appropriate for working in this field, that you 
that you are the right person to continue pursuing this interest. So there, there's a, there seems to be a lot of variety of programs um, for pursuing permanent residency in Canada. I would say that in the US, we sometimes you have to use more creativity within the fewer tracks that we have, um, which, which does sometimes limit it because you, you can't clearly say, I definitely fall into this, but in another sense opens up the door because you can advocate for your position and for your, for your knowledge base and for what you have to contribute to uh, your field generally speaking in this country. So there's there's a certain amount of creativity that's involved here. Mm -hmm. It seems like, you know, if you're an Einstein, it's easier to uh, immigrate to the US than Canada, because honestly, I don't think Einstein can pass the express entry, <laughs> you know, uh, thing. But if you're not as smart as Einstein, you might have a better chance. And you're younger. <laughs> you I would say the threshold is lower than that, that, but yeah. <laughs> If you're not Einstein, we'll describe you in a way that <laughs> convinces like immigration that you are. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, well, I think we're basically out of time. Uh, but thank you all for joining us today. Um, and we'll be sending you emails uh, where you can contact us uh, to schedule you know, personal consultations with, with either uh, Pearl Cohen or with Lama and Goji. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll welcome you to, to, do, uh, to join us for future webinars as well. Uh, thank you again for, for attending. Thanks, guys, for, for being such great Thank company. you. Bye. Thanks. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank Bye. you, Zia. All right. Take care, everyone. Thanks, Dar. See you later. Bye-bye.